talk about the impact of the extraordinary events going on in Russia. So unexpected and very fast moving events. And that's my question of the day, actually, is why have President Putin and Evgeny Prigozhin done a deal last night when it looks as though Putin uh, was, uh, was on the run? Will it help or hinder the war in Ukraine? Well, to help me answer some of these questions is, of course, an expert, Bill Browder, head of the Global Magnitsky Justice Campaign, author of some great books. A very good morning to you, Bill. Thanks for being with us on Ty's Talk. Uh, this situation is obviously very fast moving, but uh, you are, you've been very close to uh, matters regarding Russia and Putin for, for decades now. How... How shocked were you by the turn of events over the last 36 hours? And um, why do you think that uh, Prigozhin has, has suddenly sort of, when he looked to have the upper hand, uh, done a deal and um, apparently gone to Belarus? Well, it's, it's, it's all very mysterious. Um, uh, I think anybody who's had any experience with Russia is scratching their heads right now and trying to figure out all the different... Um, features of this deal that are that have been done under the table that we're, we, we don't see because none of, as you say none of it makes any sense um so you know you, what you had was was a uh, a a very fierce brutal sadistic uh, warlord who with many uh, probably 25,000 uh, followers troops in his in his private military company that that have seem to be succeeding in, in taking over Rostov, which is a, a relatively large uh, town in southern Russia, then moving on to Voronezh, and then moving on to Moscow. And it, and it looked like there was no resistance at any point along the way. And so it, it's, it's totally mysterious um, why he would have just stopped in his tracks when he was doing so well. Um, there's lots of theories out there. Um, perhaps the main theory that, that I have is, is that he thought that he had people inside the um, sort of establishment who were going to side with him when he got to Moscow. And um, Putin probably got to those people and said, uh, uh, you're, you can't do this, and they didn't. Um, you know, it's, it's not possible for 25,000 people to take over a country unless they get the uh, establishment troops to lay down their arms and to get people to sort of come and, on board. And, and that's probably been his miscalculation. Right, because there were suggestions that sort of coming through the, around the middle of yesterday that that, that process of uh, Russian units starting to, uh, to switch over to the Wagner side, but maybe that was, as you say, a miscalculation, maybe that wasn't happening. Well, it probably was happening on a small scale. It certainly was happening in Rostov because they weren't putting up a fight in these other places. But, you know, to get to Moscow with 25,000 troops, you can't take over a whole country of 150 million people unless you have the establishment sort of siding your way. Now, there are probably other things that played into this. We know that that um, uh, Prigozhin has a family. Um, we know that, that he's kind of a mafia guy and Putin's a mafia guy. And so... Um, they could have easily threatened his family. Um, we know that they raided his office and found all sorts of um, passports and drugs and, and cash and other things like that. And so, I mean, it, it, and we, we may never know what's happening here, but um, we'll probably know more in the future. What I can say is that this is absolutely terrible for Putin um, and good for Ukraine, what's happened here. The fact that, that the most effective soldier, the one who the Ukrainians actually raided, um, is no longer in circulation, and that his war force has been disbanded is a good thing for Ukraine. Because, fact that yes, because presumably the effect on morale on Russian commanders and troops in Ukraine is, is devastating and, and very bad indeed. And it, for sure. And, and you know, the, the regular troops are not good. Um, they're, they're, they're really are, are, are terrible to start out with. And the only ones that had any effectiveness was Prigozhin and his Wagner uh, private military company. And, and if they're out of the game, then it just makes it easier for the Ukrainians to um, uh, keep on pushing with their counteroffensive. But the other really important thing is that the, 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 everybody in the world and the Russians in particular got to see how undefended the rest of the country was. That if, if a warlord can just drive into Rostov and take over a military base, that means that, that the whole infrastructure, the whole system um, is as rotten as the military that we saw trying to take over 
Ukraine. Yes, because and because there were suggestions that uh, that Putin had fled Moscow for uh, for his presidential palace, uh, but also I guess the, the the other question is what's happened to his defence minister Shogu and his chief of staff uh, General Gerasimov. Well, as as of right now, they're still in place. Um, the, the, the the when when Putin's press secretary was discussing um, their fate. He said that those discussions didn't come up in the negotiations. Now, um, uh, Putin absolutely can't be seen to have been blackmailed by uh, Prigozhin into letting these people go. They may very well go at some point in the future, but if Putin were to sort of say that was part of the deal, then he looks intensely weak. He doesn't look like a proper head of state. And, and what you have to understand about Putin is that his whole, the whole thing, uh, his being in power, staying in power is all about him looking strong, looking brutal, um, having everybody scared of him. And so he can't afford to be looking weak right now. And, and um, if he were to let these people go, he would look weak. Even without letting them go, he looks weak. Uh, I would say that he's seriously damaged by this whole incident. I think that this is the beginning of a much bigger problem for him. Um, and I think this is the beginning of a bigger opportunity for Ukraine, the fact that the Russians are fighting among themselves so but it violently. Is, I, I guess also it's, it's dangerous for all of us, which is why the West is actually... Uh, wisely sort of keeping counsel, viewing it as an internal matter, because a cornered Putin could be a very dangerous Putin. Well, it, the whole thing is, is terrifying from every angle. Uh, a, a cornered Putin is a dangerous Putin. A non-cornered Putin is a dangerous Putin. But so is is a mafia warlord um, who is uh, an ex-convict who kills people with a sledgehammer who could be taking over. And the whole thing is is horrifying from every different standpoint. And this is a country, of course, that has the largest nuclear arsenal in the world. Yeah. And so it's just terrifying any possible way you look at it. And, and, um, uh, is, and is it possible the pair, of it, the pair of them sort of slightly looked over the abyss yesterday and realised how things could spiral out of control with all of those implications within Russia? Well, I mean, I, I think that a, a everybody look, looked at that. And, and the most scary thing is, is that um, what do you do if... if uh, if Russia descends into a civil war and you have all these loose nukes out there, that that's the that's the that's the true terrifying scenario. We kind of you kind of need that those nuclear weapons under some type of responsible control. And I and I, I can't say that Putin is responsible control. There's a lot of people out there that say, well, he's the devil. We know he's threatened to use these nukes in yeah. in Ukraine, and so we should not fall for this this weird fallacy that that. Um, uh, that you know he's better than than the unknown person. Um, they're all bad, um, and we and we probably have no influence over how it's going to play itself out. They're going to determine that for themselves. All we need to do is figure out how we contain the damage on the outside. Well, all the different things that the West needs to do to contain this effectively rogue state. Uh, that's right. It's uh, uh, there are no good options. It's all uh, effectively terrifying. Um, Bill, thank you so much indeed for your thoughts on that. That's Bill Browder. Uh, author and head of the Global Magnitsky Justice Campaign. He spent a lot of time in Russia. He really understands uh, the thinking behind uh, what may be going on. And, of course, watch the news that we get, whether it's through social media or through the official channels. One has to read it between the lines because uh, much of it will be propaganda put out by the different vest it interests. But anyway, uh, thank you to Bill there. Let